Welcome to PRS Grand Rounds. Thank you for joining us. We will be starting now. <clears throat> the articles from this collection and this lecture are available on prsjournal.com. There's a collection of articles, as you can see on the screen now. So please visit prsjournal.com to view this excellent collection of articles curated specifically for this talk. Thank you for joining us for PRS Grand Rounds. We are very proud of our journal and this PRS Grand Rounds, which is a national award winner for best use of social media platform. So thank you to all the lecturers, participants, and to you, our audience, for contributing and being an excellent audience for PRS Journal and PRS Journal Grand Rounds. The topic today is animating the paralyzed face with free functional segmental gracilis transfer. This lecture is by Dr. Allison Snyder Warwick at Washington University in St. Louis School of Medicine. Dr. Snyder Warwick is a pediatric microsurgeon which specializes in facial reanimation procedures. I'm gonna turn it over to her now and we are gonna get started in this lecture. Please remember that after PRS Grand Rounds, immediately following, we will have a live Q&A session where you can ask your questions. Feel free to ask your questions at any time on Facebook Live, on Twitter, and we will uh, answer your questions after this talk, immediately after. Thank you very much. Now introducing Dr. Snyder Warwick. Hi everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. It's my pleasure to be here at the Journal of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Grand Rounds event, and I'm honored to present work on uh, facial nerve reconstruction. Facial expression really provides a lot of rich information about emotional status, more so than voice. Even with the inflections in voice, it doesn't convey the same type of emotion that facial movements express. Morphology of facial motion is really what conveys these emotions. Uh, the timing of facial movement is less important in conveying emotion. And there are distinctive universal expressions for anger, fear, disgust, uh, sadness, and enjoyment. And it's Ekman and Friesen who first described uh, 46 action units to correspond to each individual facial movement. The facial action coding system decomposes facial movement into the individual muscles um, that create the action. And here shown in this image are the upper, upper facial muscles that convey um, action units one, two, four, six, and seven. And this information was used in the development of Toy Story um, to make the characters more human-like. So when we lose our ability to express ourselves with facial movement, it's devastating. And not only do patients bear a significant psychosocial burden, but there's also a lot of functional consequences. And those correspond to loss of multiple sphincters within the face. Loss of the ocular sphincter leads to drying of the cornea, ulcerations, frequent tearing, and sometimes scarring that could lead to loss of vision ultimately. Loss of the nasal sphincter leads to chronic nasal congestion, which is quite bothersome to patients. And loss of the oral sphincter leads to oral incompetence, drooling, and speech difficulties. And of course, the psychosocial burden alone is uh, tremendous. So how do we reconstruct facial movement? Well, there are many techniques that have been described. Um, and while the techniques may vary, the goals are similar. And those are to create symmetry and balance. And we want to have symmetry both at rest and with animation. And we need to have controlled movement. You know, overexpression um, can be unnatural and disfiguring and call attention. And of course, we want to restore function with creation of those different sphincters within the face. Eye protection is always paramount in acquired facial paralysis and congenital facial paralysis. And we want to reconstruct facial movement while minimizing donor deficits as well. I like this chart because it uh, summarizes acquired facial nerve injuries into favorable and unfavorable. And you can think about nerve injuries in this way, which really impacts the treatment that you may provide as well as timing of treatment. And treatment really depends on three things. The severity of the nerve injury, um, the distance from the nerve injury to the target, and then the time from injury. And unfortunately, we don't have an infinite window in which to reconstruct um, facial movement after an acquired nerve injury. With most nerve injuries, you have a window of approximately 12 to 18 months to re innervate that native musculature. 
And of course, reinnervating the native mimetic musculature is better than any reconstructive technique that we have. So intervening within that window, if possible and appropriate, is ideal. In the facial muscle, we may have a little bit longer window, maybe up to 24 months, but we know that time is muscle. And the longer we wait to reconstruct or the longer the time um, for nerve reinnervation to occur, there are degenerative changes that occur both within the nerve and within the muscle that make function less ideal. There are also degenerative changes that occur at the neuromuscular junction, which is shown in the lower panel. These are multiple neuromuscular junctions. And potentially, investigation of the neuromuscular junction could lengthen this critical window in which we have to intervene or improve the quality of functional recovery after reinnervation. This talk tonight is going to focus on dynamic smile reconstruction. So this would be in the case of congenital facial paralysis or chronic facial nerve injuries, chronic facial paralysis. So in these circumstances, we need both new nerve and new muscle. Uh, free functional muscle transfer to the face was first described by Hari in 1976. And although regional muscle is available for reconstruction, I prefer free functional muscle uh, because of the versatility of design that this technique allows. It allows greater control over position, vector, and tension of the inset of the muscle. And you can do that while having minimal donor de deficit. Um, and there are multiple muscle um, options to perform uh, free functional transfer to the face. Ideally, uh, the muscle flap would have redundant function to minimize donor deficit. We want the flap to be an easy dissection and have a reliable pedicle with minimal size. Um, the length contraction ratio is related to the relationship of the muscle fibers. Parallel muscle fibers have increased length of excursion, but less strength, whereas pennate muscle fibers have greater strength, but a shorter excursion. In the face, we don't need a lot of strength because we're not moving bones like we are in um, multiple areas of the body, but instead we're really moving skin to create a smile. So we don't need a lot of strength and we really prefer to have increased excursion of that smile movement. So I prefer muscles that have parallel fiber arrangements. We also wanna be able to control the vector to have a natural appearing vector. And we want that effect to be stable and we won't, don't wanna worry about disinsertion of the muscle over time. So there are many muscles that have been applied to uh, free functional muscle transfers to the face, but the one that we're gonna focus on tonight is the gracilis. And I prefer the gracilis because of many of the ideal qualities. And we're also able to take only a small portion of the gracilis, so the segment that has the neurovascular pedicle. The gracilis has many advantages. The uh, dissection is very straightforward and it has a reliably located and functioning pedicle. The muscle fiber arrangement is parallel, as I mentioned previously, which leads to ideal excursion in the face. And there's minimal donor morbidity as there are multiple other adductor muscles of the thigh. And because of the anatomy, we are able to tailor this muscle ideally for the patient's needs. Um, the gracilis is a Matheson High type two um, muscle flap. It's based on the ascending branch of the medial circumflex femoral artery. Um, and it overall has very consistent anatomy, but some variations have been described. Adel Fattah described the arterial anatomy within the gracilis, and really there are three main courses um, of the artery. It can be dichotomous, an array formation, or a dual pedicle. The gracilis typically um, has the nerve and artery um, with variable relationships running through the muscle, but both run between the longitudinal muscle compartments. And typically there are four to seven compartments, um, each comprising a functional unit within the gracilis muscle. Um, dissection is uh, very straightforward. Uh, the vena comitans typically are two that are on either side of the artery. Um, and another advantage of the gracilis is that the vena comitans branch outside of the muscle which allows us to um, take only a segment without compromising uh, perfusion or outflow of the muscle. Typically, one of the vena comitants is larger um, than the other. And then innervation, of course, is from the anterior branch of the obturator nerve. And this nerve has a nice length um, that can be used to co-apt to uh, varying nerve sources that would be used in the face. 
And because of all this anatomy, we are able to take only a segment of the muscle. And this was first described by Drs. Mengtelo and Zucker in 1984, uh, the idea of these fascicular territories within the muscle. Um, and in most cases, there is one fascicle controls the anterior 30 to 40 percent of the muscle, whereas the posterior 60 to 70 percent of the muscle may be divided into individual territories or may respond as a single unit, as per uh, their report. And so this allows us to cut the muscle both transversely and longitudinally to minimize bulk in the face because we want to have symmetry of soft tissue volume and a natural appearance. So let's go into the gracilis harvest. The markings are very straightforward from the pubic symphysis to the medial femoral condyle. Um, a line is drawn and then the incision is uh, posterior to this line over the uh, level of the gracilis. And often you can pluck the location of the gracilis in a child or in someone who has a thin uh, thigh. Um, after skin incision, you often encounter the sentinel vein, and that corresponds to the location of the neurovascular pedicle on the deep surface of the muscle. The gracilis is more easily identified uh, distally, and you want to be certain that you are dissecting the gracilis um, before proceeding further. It is the most superficial adductor muscle and is located posterior to the saphenous vein. Distil or dissection can start distally, um, circumferentially, and then the minor pedicle as well as the dominant pedicle should be identified before dividing um, the minor pedicle. Um, as you dissect along the main neurovascular pedicle, um, you will see the nerve coursing more proximally and then you'll see branches going to the adductor longus muscle. Um, these need to be divided to increase the length of the vascular pedicle and also to allow you to have better visualization of the pedicle as it uh, courses more proximally to the um, uh, profunda um, femoris, femoris. Um, the pedicle can be dissected either by retracting the adductor longus or by making a window between the adductor longus and rectus um, femoris muscle. And then here you see that the adductor um, branches have been uh, divided where the yellow arrows are, and you can see the increased length on the vascular pedicle as it courses proximally. And that's useful particularly to reach the facial vessels, which are my um, preference for um, vascular anastomosis within the face. So several points to optimize the gracilis transfer to the face. We want to take only what we need. Um, so that includes the length. So typically I measure from the oral commissure to the helical root and add an additional two centimeters to that length. And that's the length of the gracilis that I would harvest from the thigh. There are multiple ways to determine length and also to determine the uh, resting length of the muscle so you can reestablish that natural resting length when you inset the muscle to the face. You wanna take only what you need in terms of bulk. So we've talked a lot about the ability to debulk and only take a segment of the gracilis muscle. And so typically, um, I leave the anterior two-thirds to one-half of the muscle within the thigh, and I'm also able to debulk a strip of muscle posteriorly. And here you can see those two strips intact in the thigh with the segment of the gracilis to be harvested in the center. And then I also debulk a layer of muscle superficially from the gracilis as well. Um, debulking should be done in situ within the thigh while the muscle is perfused. One, it minimizes ischemia time, but you also want to be sure that you have adequate hemostasis of the muscle so as to avoid um, unnecessary hematomas within the face. And then um, you need to be sure that you have a method for reestablishing resting length of the muscle. Um, and so you can either measure the length as um, I prefer to do or reestablish um, markings along the muscle at resting length before dividing the muscle transversely. And then the muscle flap is isolated on the pedicle. And here we show the technique of debulking. This is performed by Dr. Wong in Toronto at SickKids. And we want to spread the muscle fibers um, parallel to the fibers so you don't divide the muscle fibers themselves. And really, you can do this very bluntly because you're able to spread those parallel fibers very easily into any location. And we want all the fibers to be functional. And then we want to be sure that we haven't caused iatrogenic injury, so we electrically stimulate the nerve to the gracilis and see the nice contraction at the end of our debulking procedure while still perfused in the thigh. And so when harvesting the muscle, this is a small segment of muscle. It usually is 8 to 10 grams. In a pediatric patient, 
In adults or in people who have a larger thigh and therefore a larger gracilis, that weight may be higher and even um, double that size. And here's um, the orientation of the gracilis, although it will be inset much higher, going from the oral commissure to the um, temple. And here um, we're showing the technique of inset of the muscle. Um, and this portion of the case is really critical. So prior to muscle harvest, you will have placed your inset sutures to reestablish the nasal labial fold. And that's very important to create a natural appearing fold. And I always mark that uh, preoperatively. And then I think a key point is to get those inset sutures medial enough um, to not have a lateral nasal labial fold. And then the sutures that create the nasal labial fold are then inset to the gracilis, which are shown in, this, in these videos um, by Dr. Zucker. And each suture, I usually place four sutures, one at the oral commissure, two in the upper lip, and one in the lower lip. Each of these four sutures has uh, two bites within the perioral region and two bites within the gracilis muscle. So that really provides a strong inset, and it's important to be organized with your sutures, so that way you can um, uh, very snugly cinch them into position because we don't want to have dehiscence of this inset of the proximal portion of the muscle from the oral commissure region uh, because that is very difficult to reconstruct. So you want to have a nice stable inset. And then here is the muscle um, after inset, uh, proximally and after microvascular anastomoses, um, shown here to the facial vessels. And the neural coaptation has been performed. And then the distal end of the gracilis muscle will be inset to the temporal region, a little more vertical than its uh, position here. Um, and we put that inset tension at a point that just starts to elevate the oral commissure. So several pearls about this procedure. You want to be sure to leave adequate subcutaneous fat on the cheek flap to avoid unnatural tethering of the muscle with animation, which can be quite um, distracting and disfiguring. There can be many vascular variations, particularly with patients um, who have congenital facial paralysis or a history of lymphatic or um, vascular malformations or patients who have had previous surgery. Um, you want to minimize bulk and optimize ischemia time. Um, you want to be sure to have appropriate length and tension, careful inset, stable inset. Um, you want to get the right vector of the muscle. And you want to be very critical of your results and evaluate your progress. Um, so I'll speak briefly about innervation sources. There are two that are my favorite and uh, for this technique. Uh, the first is utilizing the contralateral facial nerve if it's available and using a buccal branch that does smile and is redundant um, with a cross facial nerve graft via a two-stage technique. And here you can see the sural nerve placed across the upper lip. Or utilizing the ipsilateral uh, masseteric nerve um, in a single stage technique. Now each nerve source has its advantages and disadvantages. Um, the masseteric nerve tends to have more power and therefore greater excursion, but requires more motor re-education and may not achieve spontaneous smile as easily as the cross facial nerve graft technique. The cross facial nerve graft tends to have a little less power and requires the two stages, but requires less motor re-education postoperatively. And this is a study that was performed um, at Sickens in Toronto with Drs. Zucker and Borchel, where we looked at myelinated axon counts in the masseteric nerve compared to the downstream cross facial nerve graft at the time of the second stage procedure. And you can see that there's three times as many myelinated fibers in the masseteric nerve, and that um, corresponds to the increased oral commissure excursion we see with use of that nerve. Um, and our study uh, doubled the amount of excursion seen in the cross facial uh, nerve graft smiles. So let's look at a few patients. This patient had a history of a viral illness at the age of two that resulted in left sided facial paralysis. And um, because I think that both nerve sources provide excellent results, I, um, I use a shared decision making approach with patients to discuss options for neurotization of the gracilis flap and I allow patients to choose after we've had a thorough discussion of each source. And so she opted for the cross facial nerve graft. And here she is at 15 to 18 months post-op from some pictures that she had sent to me after her uh, surgery. Uh, this patient had a history of congenital right-sided facial paralysis. And uh, she and her family opted for use of the right masseteric nerve um, to drive her free functional gracilis to the face. And here she is at one year post-op 
and here's her video. And she had a little more difficulty with um, motor re-education. She had difficulty with spontaneity of movement. And you'll see as she's going through her different facial movements here, we'll get to the small smile in just a moment, and then her larger smile. She does a nice job when cued for smile, but later as she gets a little silly in the video, you see she doesn't really fire the gracilis. So here's her small smile and then a little bit larger smile. And then she laughs really hard and she doesn't fire that muscle much at all. But here she is at three and a half years later and she's had a lot more luck with her motor re-education over time and um, um, probably with a little bit of age. And you can see that she has much more dental show. She has improved elevation of the right upper lip to achieve that dental show. And she qualitatively had more spontaneity, although that is very difficult to measure. But that's just based off the comments from her family and from her herself. This young man has a history of Mobius syndrome resulting in bilateral facial paralysis. He underwent uh, staged reconstructions, um, doing one side of the face at a time with uh, use of the ipsilateral mesoteric nerve and a free functional gracilis transfer. And here he is five and a half months after completion of the second side of his reconstruction. And he had much better luck with motor re-education. He was able very early on, in fact, at this point of this video, to perform open mouth smiles and to separate smiling from chewing. And here he is playing with each side. And then just to show that um, the gracilis muscle does grow with patients, um, you can see here he is four years later uh, with um, continued uh, excellent ability to smile, good um, commissure excursion bilaterally. And you can see that there's no facial contractures. He had no pain or discomfort, um, despite a lot of growth that he had had in the interim. And in general, um, uh, dynamic smile reconstruction with a free functional muscle transfer is very successful, but it's not perfect. Uh, success rates are 75 to 90% in the literature, despite this being a, an elective um, planned procedure. Um, and that's likely related to the very technical uh, and detail-oriented nature of the uh, surgical procedure. The results are very stable over the long term. Muscles do grow with patients and the movement stays uh, with patients. Um, over time. Some groups report revision rates of around 30% in the literature, but I think a lot of attention to uh, muscle size at the time of the original procedure can minimize those numbers because most revisions are related to debulking. Um, the most re commonly reported complica complications are hematoma and infection, um, but patients overall are very happy and their self-reported outcomes are much higher and more positive compared to their surgeons which I think is appropriate because we all know that there is room for improvement. And I think in particular, we could improve in these areas. Dynamic, creating a natural appearing dynamic eye closure uh, would be ideal. And there's a lot of work ongoing with that now. And I hope that that continues and we have um, an, a great solution for patients in the future. Lower lip depression, um, there are some Wonderful procedures and results being produced already, but I hope that um, continues. And I hope that research, particularly investigation of the neuromuscular junction, can increase that uh, critical window in which we have to intervene after nerve injury and make outcomes um, better. And synkinesis, which we did not talk about at all in this talk, um, is a very challenging arena in the subject of facial paralysis and facial nerve reconstruction. And we have a lot of opportunity for improvement there as well. So thank you all for tuning in. And now we will go to your live questions. Thank you, everybody. We're going to now start the live Q&A. This is a reminder that you can find a collection of articles associated with this talk on the prsjournal.com website in the articles and issues section. And there's a collections that has select articles that are curated specifically for this talk on the topic of facial reanimation and dynamic facial reanimation. Thank you again. We're going to start our question and answer session. You can ask questions live on the Facebook live stream and I will read them to you or to Dr. Snyder Warwick and then she will answer your questions um, as they come in, okay? The first question is from Dr. Danielle Brown. How long is the recovery process and when do you expect to see the final result? Great question, Danielle. Uh, recovery is an ongoing process. So after a free functional muscle transfer, I tend to keep patients in the hospital for five to seven days just for vascular monitoring. And also 
particularly in pediatric patients, to keep them a little bit quieter um, because they will be feeling quite well after the first few days and they need reminders to kind of slow down and take it easy. I do have a lot of post-operative restrictions as far as no pressure on the face and um, you know decreased activity. And I don't want patients to have a lot of cold temperatures either with eating or externally, um, given the size of the vasculature involved. Um, expected results, it um, depends on the innervation source. So the masseteric nerve provides um, a much faster smile reconstruction, usually within um, the first sometimes two months, but usually around three months. And the cross-facial nerve graft um, can be around six months before you see movement of that muscle. Thank you for that question. The next comment is from Dr. Rod Warwick. Superb results. When do you not use the gracilis flap for facial reanimation? Thanks so much. Yeah, I think um, that's an excellent question. Not every patient would be a candidate for a free uh, muscle transfer. And in some patients, they're just not willing to undergo uh, a lengthy procedure and uh, longer recovery. And I think regional muscle transfers have excellent results. Um, uh, so I think just taking in the whole picture of the patient, their comorbidities, their wishes, their goals is really important when designing their reconstruction. Perfect. And on similar lines, thanks, Dr. Rourke, for that question. On similar lines from Dr. Sanik, Great talk. What do you think of the role of static procedures in combination uh, with reanimation with free gracilis? That's a great question as well. Uh, and thank you for that. Um, particularly in adult patients who have uh, a heavier face um, and have more uh, age-related changes of the face, I think that static procedures can be combined to create better resting symmetry um, and uh, more thorough tone because the gracilis muscle itself may not um, prevent all of the um, ptosis as well as the deviation to the working side of the face if it's a unilateral case. I also think that static procedures can be a really great option in uh, patients maybe who have facial paralysis related to uh, oncologic causes and maybe don't have a great um, quality of life currently and may not have a lot of longevity of life expected. And so improving quality while minimizing risk and minimizing downtime uh, would be important. Perfect. This question is from Pepe Telich. Any thoughts on supercharging the gracilis flap by combining cross-facial nerve graft and masseteric nerve? A lot of people provide uh, dual innervation to the gracilis muscle utilizing those two uh, nerve sources. And so the idea behind that is that you could have the advantages of each innervation source. So more spontaneity from the cross-facial graph, but more excursion related to the power of the masseteric nerve. Um, and I think that you know the jury is somewhat still out on that um, to determine how much improvement you get from each innervation source and how much contribution uh, because if we think about the neuromuscular junction and, um, you know, the innervation of that muscle, the re of that muscle, you know, we'd have to determine if a, mus a nerve that arrives at the muscle after the first nerve arrives, if that is able to achieve additional formation of neuromuscular junctions. So I think great, uh, a lot of surgeons are showing great results, and uh, I think all of us are working on trying to figure out how to measure spontaneity to show that effect. On a summer line, this question is from Lily Mundy. Amazing results and great talk. What type of outcome measures are you using to evaluate outcomes in these patients? Uh, another great question. So there are some uh, patient-reported outcome scales um, that have been validated. Um, there is the um, face scale, uh, which is commonly used, and then there is um, there's another scale from uh, Canada, which I can get to you. Um, I'm blanking on the name currently. The Alberta scale, actually, Alberta scale. And then um, the um, face cue is being worked on for facial paralysis as well. So a lot of great work happening for validated scores. Perfect. This question is from Andrew Timberlake. Do you ever combine the gracilis with a plantar sling? Um, I haven't combined the gracilis with a plantar sling, but I think that use of static slings can uh, be very appropriate with use of the free functional gracilis. I've used um, tensor fasciolata uh, before and taking a strip of that um, to support the, the mid-face and the nasolabial fold region. This question is similar to one previously asked, but a little different from Alex Sun. 
Thank you for the lecture. Regarding looking at axonal counts, do you think this is a technique that can also be applied to studying variations or free muscle transfer alone, like double innervation or multivector flaps? Do you think this quantitative data would play a role in surgical planning? Um, that's a great question. I think that uh, Reinnervation of the gracilis muscle is harder to measure in human patients because uh, biopsying the nerve is more difficult to do. Um, with the studies that have been done previously, you uh, biopsy the end of the masseteric nerve at the time you do the coaptation, or the distal end of the cross-facial graft, which you're trimming anyway before you do your coaptation to the obturator nerve. Um, so I think animal models could be really useful just to answer the big question of uh, how do things reinnervate when uh, the nerve sources arrive at different times? This question is from Mario Sicano. Sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly. What is the best moment to approach newborns diagnosed with congenital facial paralysis? Great question. I think that um, talking with the families um, as early as possible is really important. You can provide a lot of useful information, and there can be a lot of anxiety involved uh, with uh, families who have a young child with facial paralysis and uh, definitely providing good information is useful. You can also refer families to um, uh, different support groups for re or for um, resources as well. Um, plus, you want to be sure the patient has good ocular protection. Kids with congenital causes of facial, facial paralysis tend to have better innate ocular protection than people with acquired facial paralysis, but it's still important that they see an ophthalmologist regularly for good exams. And then as far as when you do the reconstruction, it depends on the etiology of the facial paralysis. If it's truly congenital and not related to birth trauma, um, then I would wait um, until minimum age of five before I did the microvascular anastomosis associated with the gracilis. So that might mean that I would start the cross-facial graft at age four if that's what they elected to go with for an innervation source, um, but not the free functional muscle until age five. And that's just um, my preference. Perfect. Uh, from Dr. Sanik, will you do any of these as immediate flap transfers in the setting of oncological resection of the facial nerve? Um, no. In that setting, um, the mimetic facial musculature would still be useful, and so I would do a nerve-based reconstruction without a free functional muscle transfer to attempt to reinnervate those muscles, um, depending on the situation involved. And I would do that in a delayed fashion from the oncologic resec resection, if possible. Um, but if it's a parotid resection and, you know, you're at the location of the um, resection, then I would just do the grafting or the, or the nerve transfers at the time of the oncologic resection to avoid um, going back into the same field. This question is from Mike Keyes. Which leg do you choose for the gracilis harvest? Do you go by patient limb dominance? Um, you can use either leg. Um, so you can um, take into account patient preference or limb dominance if you wish. Um, I tend to do the same side of the face that I'm transferring the muscle to uh, just to facilitate um, the surgical procedure and to keep things unified, but you certainly could use the other side as well. This question is from Dr. Francesco Igro. Who are the ideal candidates? Which patients do best and worst? Um, I think there are a variety of um, patients who do really well with this procedure. I think that um, younger patients uh, tend to do an excellent job with the uh, motor re-education. Um, so use of the masseteric nerve seems to be easier for some patients, although I've had younger patients who didn't do as well, and I've had older patients that have done fantastic as well. So it's not a hard, fast rule, but I think that cortical plasticity is, um, is useful. Um, and I think I'll take this moment to say that working with a physical therapist is really important, and even having patients meet with the therapist before doing the reconstruction can be useful. Um, patients who do worse, well, I think that anyone who's not um, completely on board uh, with the idea of undergoing reconstruction or they want a quick fix is uh, uh, concerning and you should hesitate before proceeding. This question is from Angelo Barone. Phenomenal talk. What are the ancillary additional procedures that you normally combine after the main procedures and in what percentage of cases? Um, I um, haven't done a lot of revisions on uh, patients where I did their original reconstruction. Um, I think that most of the time revisions are related to debulking, and I have um, one patient that I've done debulking procedures on. Um, and so again, I think that working on really taking your time at the initial procedure to 
optimize um, all components of the flap that you can, all components of the inset that you can, getting the right tension, getting the right vector is going to uh, minimize the need for revisions. Um, uh, occasionally revisions are, are, people seek revisions to try to improve the vector or if the muscle is dehissed from the perioral region, but that's extremely difficult to fix. Also the tethering um, related to the dermis contacting the muscle is very difficult to fix, and I don't think there are perfect solutions for those things. This question is from Dr. Johnny Liu. Do you ever customize your anchoring sutures for gracilis? Do you always anchor the lower lip? Thank you, Johnny. Great question. I don't always anchor the lower lip. Um, I do that always in a patient who has difficulties with oral incompetence, um, so drooling or oral incompetence to solids or liquids, um, just to provide more support to the lower lip. Um, but in patients who have great tone and great function of their lower lip, then I may only do three inset sutures and not place the one at the lower lip. Perfect. This is just going to take a moment to remind you that the collection of articles is available on prsjournal.com, and you can uh, access this talk um, that will be video archived and will be hosted with the article collection as well. They'll be on prsjournal.com. We're going to continue to take some questions here. From Ankur uh, Kajuria, Ankur, I think we talked about the uh, patient-reported outcome measures. Um, so this question is then from Andrea Ka. If one gracilis fails in classic Mobius syndrome, what is your next reanimation option? Uh, I would use the, the second gracilis as my first choice. If the patient has um, bilateral facial paralysis, then you could consider um, other muscles like the um, latissimus or... Um, Actually, additional muscles in the thigh have been utilized. Um, there have been many, many different muscles um, utilized. Some people use uh, PEC, PEC minor. Um, so then I would, you know, look at the patient's overall um, functional status, comorbidities, you know, any concerns related to any donor sites, and, and then try to choose the best choice that minimizes any donor deficit. This question is from Eduardo Linero. Great talk. Thank you for sharing your results. Based on your experience, how much time does it take to observe the maximum post-operative result after surgery, and what is the role of rehab? Yeah. Rehab is really important, and the outcome and the, the morphology of the smile does change. When the patients initially get movement, they get a small flicker of movement um, near the oral commissure, um, but over time, the excursion improves. And I think that really you can unveil the optimal result in your patients by working closely with the therapist. And a lot of the therapy is done as a home program, but it's uh, really important that the therapist sort of orchestrates that program and is checking in with the patient and guiding them on when to graduate to the next level of exercises. Uh, because I think you'll find that your results are so much better and patients may have more movement than they actually realized and they can tweak that movement more. And I think during the first year, you see a lot of change, but you may see changes beyond that first year as well. Um, and the one patient I showed her result at three and a half years, you know, she started having the lip elevation in a delayed fashion. And I think that was actually after the first year where she really started having more vertical movement with increased dental show. So it's important to continue to follow the patients and provide guidance and have the therapist involved. This question is from Dr. Kyle Sanek. What are your thoughts on nerve transfer, specifically in regards to dynamic transfers for blink? Uh, yeah, as I mentioned, um, dynamic blink reconstruction is uh, really challenging, and I think that's a huge area for um, opportunity for improvement in the field. I don't have um, experience with um, dynamic blink reconstruction um, as of today, but I think that reconstructing like with like is, is ideal. Um, and if you're unable to do that, because of course cross-facial uh, graphs are it's uh, very stressful for the nerve, very challenging. You lose a lot of nerve fibers along the way. Um, then uh, getting something that has um, uh, an easy motor re-education um, ability post-operatively. Um, so a lot of people do use masteteric um, for not only smile, but also for blink. And that makes sense because we squint as we smile um, and biting down is easy when, when squinting. So thinking and maybe talking with your therapist ahead of time about planning a reconstruction to sort of facilitate the um, post-operative rehab course is really um, ideal. Great. A question from 
Kevin Zhu, and similar to the previous question, what are your thoughts about reanimation of the eyelid and lower lip depressors? Yeah, excellent. Highlighting all these challenging areas. Uh, so I think that we really uh, are in need of a reliable method of reconstruction that has a natural appearance, is not disfiguring, and provides the functional benefit of eye closure, um, as well as lower lip support. Lower lip depression, um, I think the main thing um, that's noticeable about lower lip depression and lack of it is the asymmetry with the other side. Um, I have found that patients that have asymmetry of lower lip depression, they have more oral incompetence. And if you just provide symmetry, um, that minimizes the oral incompetence and helps with speech. Um, I don't do dynamic procedures as of today for um, lower lip depression, but if you weaken the working side, that's an easy result that's done with injections. Um, but you have to take into account the multiple depressors of the lower lip, so depressor anguli oris versus depressor labi inferioris, and you also have to monitor the pull of those muscles related to your smile as well. So I don't have the perfect answer for dynamic reconstruction of those movements, but hopefully, you know, in the future, there will be one. This question is from O. Tasek. Is there any relation between gracilis muscle weight and oral commissure excursion? Um, Another excellent studies or excellent questions from the audience tonight. Um, so no, as of currently, there's not a um, correlation in the literature between muscle weight and um, excursion. We actually have an ongoing study uh, looking at that. Um, but right now, I don't have an answer for you. Perfect. We're going to take one more question, but I wanted to take one last moment to remind everyone that the collection of articles will be available on prsjournal.com as well as this video lecture will be archived there. So you can find it all on the web journal website, prsjournal.com. And thank you so much for joining us for his PRS Grand Rounds. The last question is from Dr. Lily Mundy. And that question is, what have been the biggest challenges in starting to do facial reanimation? And what advice do you have to surgeons starting out in this field? Um, so I think that you need to be confident in um, your knowledge of these techniques because as I mentioned, it's very detail oriented, a lot of the surgical procedures. I feel very fortunate that I was very well trained um, both in residency and fellowship. I was able to train with Susan McKinnon with nerve related reconstructions in residency and then in fellowship, I trained in Toronto with Dr. Zucker and Dr. Borchel. And so, um, I think that's really important is making sure you have a solid foundation. I do think that um, facial animation and facial reanimation is a field that um, is not great to dabble in and do you know one case every three years. I think it's something to, uh, to focus on. And it can be helpful to work as a team too because that um, can help de-stress the operative environment. Um, that may not always work out depending on your situation and Actually, that's not how um, I do it in my own practice here, but I think especially starting out, it's really important to know who you can ask questions to. And I certainly wasn't afraid to pick up the phone and ask for someone's advice or ask for help, particularly from my mentors to help me sort of navigate those early stages of um, cases that can be very challenging. And certainly in the OR, don't hesitate to call for help either um, if you get into a situation because it automatically just, um, de-escalates things, manages your stress level, and helps you get through that, that obstacle at the time. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Snyder Warwick, thank for you. giving this lecture tonight. It was thank excellent. Thank you, Dr. Preek. Thank you to our audience. You guys are what makes this journal and the PRS Grand Rounds go. So thank you so much for your participation and for asking such great questions. Again, excellent. the article video archive can be found in the article collection on prsjournal.com. And thank you again for joining us for this PR, PRS Grand Rounds. We will wrap it up now. Thank you so much. Have a good night.